Welcome to Sporting Girls, the BTEC Sport and Sport and Exercise Science webinar series, supporting educators and learners to maximize the value of their BTEC qualification during and beyond study. In this bite-sized webinar, we will be covering broadly, finding out more about SIMSPA, what are professional standards and how do they relate to BTEC qualifications and the benefits for learners. Okay, so for today's episode, I'm really pleased to welcome and um, delighted to have our guest with us today from Simspa. We've got Natasha Eason, who's the Interim Head of Education, and Susie Benson, who's Regional Partnership Manager, and myself, who's presenting, Gareth Reynolds, the Sector Manager for Sport at Pearson. Welcome both. Hi, Gareth. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Thanks, Tash. And how are you, Susie? Okay. Yeah, all good here. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us this morning. Brilliant. Thank you. So in terms of the session, really pleased to sort of have this session to share with our learners, our centres and people sort of interested in our BTEC qualifications, delivering our BTEC qualifications, but needing to develop their understanding, whether that's to create an understanding, develop or reinforce their understanding around you know, the term since birth. And this is a great opportunity for us to sort of support that. So I think sort of getting into the session, what I'd like to do is, first of all, be able to share with the listeners, you know, what, what and who are SIMSPA? Yeah, so I'll jump in here. So in terms of who SIMSPA are then, so for those that don't know, we are the chartered professional body for the UK sport and physical activity sector. Um, you know, so we kind of cover the workforce and everything that kind of sits within sport and physical activity, ranging from those frontline workers of lifeguard coaches all the way up to kind of managers as well. Perfect. Thank you. So then if we start looking at kind of the vision and kind of the purpose of SIMS for them. So our purpose and vision is to, to shape a respected, and regulated, recognised sector that everybody wants to be part of. You know, we want to support those that are working in the sector and all those that want to be part of the sector as well, that they see it as an area that they can see themselves developing their career through as well. Just on that, both Susie and Tash, I'm sort of mindful, obviously, funding and supported by Sports England. We've we've got lots of sort of centres across the, the nations, if you like, so Northern Ireland and Wales. It, it's since, but how does this impact them? So Simspur itself obviously covers the whole of the UK. Um, England have definitely been at the forefront of kind of taking up a lot of the standards. Um, but obviously, you'll probably recognise from Susie's accent that, that we do venture into kind of Scotland and she is our correspondence from the, the, the Scottish lands. And I'm sure she'll be able to kind of pick up how um, Scotland have started to kind of embrace the standards and everything that Simspur have been working towards as well. Perfect. Thank you. So we've, we've said who Simspur are. The vision is there. Um, so this really gets into some of that detail for, for centres and colleagues and practitioners and learners to start to understand and visualise what this looks like and what it's about. So we've got this really nice visual here, but what, what does it mean? Yeah, so Simsper wants to help develop careers. They want to, we want to inspire professionalism and set a clear kind of standards for the sector. But we have to be able to understand what the sector is. So what we've done over the past kind of couple of years is to really do some digging and some research into what makes up the sport and physical activity sector. And we've narrowed that down into six core industries. We've got exercise and fitness, professional sport, community sport, leisure operations, health and well-being and adventure sports. And what we've gone, what we've been doing is looking at kind of everything that's in, involved in those industry areas, every role that sits within there. And we've been starting to, to narrow that down in terms of the professional standards. And we've got for, uh, currently 40 of those that represent those areas of industries there and the roles that sit within that. Um, and obviously, you know, as I mentioned, workforce is obviously our driver for, for everything that we do. So we've also been looking at the, what workforce sits within those industry areas. And obviously that we've kind of categorised into three, three areas. So obviously we've got the participant, 
but obviously the three that sit behind those are the frontline workers, those direct people that are involved with, with working with the participants, the support chains, which make up the kind of managers, the support workforce, the policy makers, and then that wider workforce as well, that kind of sometimes sit across multiple sectors. And we wanna be able to kind of support um, anyone coming into the sector from their entry role, all the way working through whether they're a frontline worker support chain or if they then start to work within that wider workforce as well and we want to understand what they need as a you know as an employee as an individual working from what training they need what skills and knowledge they need and, and we want to be able to support them to know where they access that as well great there's sort of two things that uh, come to light here for me i think really useful thinking with a center perspective on or sort of learners career articulations firstly this really goes beyond and really starts to flesh out that piece that I want to be involved in the sports sector. It's not just about being a coach or a PE teacher or an athlete. There's so much more. Uh, and there's also all of those areas that support that around sport and, and the sector and the industry as a whole. So I, th I think that's that's really important. And also it gives an idea of those different progressions as well through the levels, as you said, and whether you're directly involved or you're kind of involved in a, a less direct uh, proposition as well so I think that's that's really important for the sector where we've spoken about sort of what is required and what's needed for people listening what is the engagement and the recognition from the industry and employers yes yeah, so I think we've absolutely kind of engaged with the employees and it's been the, the the start and the purpose of why we developed the professional standards and the work that we did many years ago was to really engage to to get an idea of what the employers wanted you know we want them to to kind of know who's coming through the door and be confident that they are competent in what they are going to be doing within that em, em, employer um setting so yeah the the buy-in over the years has been is, is just increasing from um, employers we've got hundreds of kind of employer partners partners that work with us to say yes we recognize the professional standards you know we we fully back them we will support and kind of contribute where we can they will put members through membership and then they'll also kind of commit to buying and putting people through training of endorsed products so from an employer side you know we've got a large number of employees that are fully engaged with that you know we work with multiple training providers awarding organization higher education partners that really see the benefit of you know the work that Simsborough are doing with the sector to really support the workforce and the end goal is to make sure that somebody is employable that he's going to get you know a, a job employment at the end of it and also see a career you know we want to attract people and keep people within the sector and we want to be able to support them with whichever route they want to take fantastic and there was a term you mentioned now around professional standards um, and that also links to uh, this term here around specialism. So I don't know if you could explain a bit more about that for us. Absolutely. Professional standards are one of my favourite things to talk about. So in terms of professional standards, and I suppose we'll look at them and say, what are they? So we've been working to identify within the sector, you know, what roles are there, um, you know, who people work with in terms of uh, the populations and environments that they kind of work within as well. So, you know, we've started this work many years ago to engage with the employees to create a, a single directory of professional standards that will underpin all the, all the training within the sector. So whether you want to access, um, you know, training for a lifeguard, a coach, a personal trainer, they're your core occupations. And what professional standards do will outline the requirements of the knowledge and skills needed to be competent in that role. Um, and that means that the employers can be confident that if somebody walks through their door, puts in a CV, applies for a job, and they've done an endorsed um, piece of training that is mapped to a professional standards, they know what they've met. They know, you know, that most of the time they've been involved in that kind of contribution of what knowledge and skills have, have been um, achieved through, you know, assessments and practical assessments as well. So you've got your occupations and you've got your specialisms, which means that actually we want to iron out the the knowledge and skills people need to work with a certain population so whether that's working with children whether that's working with people with long-term conditions and then also the environment that, that they work within so they could be working in a community environment working with that with active people or they could be working with it in a um, high performance environment so we've really started to flesh out and kind of 
want to differentiate between the different places that people work within you know and we want people to know that there's a, a, an option and a career pathway if they want to specialize in a certain area so that's what the standards are there for is to really underpin and, and to really highlight what is needed for every occupation role um within you know like i said the whether they're working with a certain population or environment and obviously technical specialisms like safeguarding uh, and we're also going to be working towards um having those for every national governing body as well great so th those standards essentially are for those given roles uh, within the industry the the employers have engaged with those and helped develop those as have sports councils and and specialists i understand yeah absolutely so when we we when we develop professional standards, we want to engage and consult with as many people as we can, you know, and that's always an, an open invite to anyone that wants to be involved with that. So that's always it. employers, um, education providers, you know, home country councils. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so two questions that, that often come up when when I speak to centres in my role is one of the first things is around, OK, we've got personal trainer. Where's the level? So historically, uh, centres, practitioners would have been used to a level two, a level three. Where does that sit here or does it not have a place and, and, and why? I think we're trying to move away from, from the levels and really look at the role itself. Um, I think, you know, over the years, employees have been very confused with the different types of the uh, qualifications that come through the door with different levels on but what we want to really do is is look at what underpins that role and the professional standards do that without having to level it so as a personal trainer you know you meet the personal trainer standard that means that you are a personal trainer you know as a as a chartered institute and a professional body you compare ourselves to kind of other chartered institutes that are there you know you would never think oh i want to employ a you know a level one accountant you know we want to get to that professionalism of people you know don't see it as a level they want to see it as a role and really understand that actually that role is is a professional and they've met the requirements to be working within that area Brilliant. No, that's a really nice example and kind of brings that to life around that professionalism. And, and obviously, as it says on the tin, that professional standard. And so the last question I was going to have there really is quite specific. It relates to that gym instructor, that personal trainer. Uh, many centres or practitioners would have been familiar with with reps. Where does that sit now? So um, you may have seen um, over news articles that have come out over social media. Obviously, we have now joined to make one single directory. Um, so as of um, obviously this summer, reps will no longer kind of exist and we will sit as Simspur as the professional body for the sector. So whereas reps kind of covered very exercise and fitness based, we are the professional body for the sector. So we have a membership opportunity um, for people to come in to be uh, recognised for their roles that they've got, but also can access kind of um, support with education partners as well. So, yeah, for anything to do with uh, membership and working within the sector, um, Simspur is the one. Perfect. Thank you. That's really clearly explained. This is really for, for me to share with centres that will be familiar with the courses. And you've used the term several times, Tash, around endorsed courses. So these courses that are on this page are endorsed and, and essentially they have a professional standard and some of them a professional standard and a specialism mapped within them. I, I, I suppose that the question, and, and maybe you've already covered it, is that why should a learner or a centre look for a qualification that's endorsed? by Simspur. So the endorsement means that it's gone through those quality checks to, to make sure that the, the qualification, the training fully aligns to the professional standard. And as I mentioned, the professional standards are all employer led. Um, you know, it, it means that the employer at the end of it knows what, what that qualification is covered. So if it's got that kind of you know stamp that 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 kite mark of the endorsement of, of simspur it means that it's gone through that robust process it means that it's mapped to the the industry recognized professional standards and you know the that the employees that we work with will recognize that and you know the as i keep mentioning it's about that end you know journey of of the learner of the individual to to get them to where they want to be whether that be in um you know route to higher education or whether that be to an employment so i suppose when we're looking at the, the the benefits of the endorsed courses it means that the employers will recognize these that it's your kind of entry into the sector 
Yeah, I think that's great. And, and I think for that dual value, if we look at the level three, firstly, the, the professional standards are mapped in there. They give that articulation out into the industry and, and that endorsement and that professional standard but also that they form part of a larger whole so that the learner in the center can also offer that free A level equivalent or whatever it may be. And the same with the level twos, whether that's learners ready to exit out into the industry or progress onto level three, they get not just the industry facing piece, they also get the piece that's going to enable them to progress through that educational pathway as well, which obviously then links onto lots of opportunities and informs the sector and benefits the sector as well. So I really like this slide. I don't know if you could just sort of walk us through it or just give us an overview. It almost speaks for itself, but um, yeah, no, if you could. Yeah, I'll talk to this. Thanks, Gareth. Thank you, Susan. Um, so ultimately, you know, going back to what um, yourself and Tash have mentioned already, I suppose ultimately it's very, very easy for us to think about professional standards as a bit of paper or a document that, that sits behind a lot of education products and that is linked to professional recognition and endorsement. However, actually, what we need to, to also start to do is take the, the document side away from things and actually, what does that mean in practice? So in future, where do we want to be as a sector? So you'll see a few examples there, but you know, one of, the, one of the real key things that, that strikes a chord for myself is, you know, how we help to support students into employment when they finish their courses and no longer have to, to redo certain pieces of learning throughout their career. Also, when we look at the, the level of understanding for our sector, among other sectors, such as healthcare or public health and NHS, um, how do we make our sector clearer and more easily identifiable for what qualifications are appropriate for people to work with certain population groups as well and really become that that respected sector we are sport and physical activity is relatively new in the grand scheme of things you know the past 20 30 years and actually how do we make sure that we're laying the foundations now for a really 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 strong sector in the future that we're future proofing um, so trying to create that openness and transparency by using professional standards, but ultimately to make a big impact moving forwards with the general public as well. Great. No, thank you. So appreciating that there's lots of sort of different memberships and ranges of support, not just for learners, for partners, etc. With the learner in mind, they've, they've done a qualification that's endorsed by SIMSPA, uh, mapped to a standard, they've achieved the standard, and then they become a, uh, a member of SIMSPA. So what, what, what are the benefits for them? What does that look like? Yeah, thanks, Gareth. So ultimately, when we look at individual membership, we are a membership body. We have approximately 16,000 individual members across um, the UK and internationally at this moment in time. And there are different elements of that, that membership and professional recognition that people can use to help to elevate their career and take it to that, that next level and stage. So in terms of that, there is that element of professional recognition. So being able to demonstrate that you have the knowledge, the understanding and the skills that set you apart from other people that are working within the sector as well that perhaps aren't members. And ultimately, by maintaining your professional status, you're also saying to employers and deployers that you're keeping yourself up to date with recent developments and recent research in the sector as well by maintaining your CPD and making sure that you're staying relevant. Within our membership, um, individuals can also access for free our SIMSPA Academy, which has more than 1,300 different e-learning courses on there. Now, they're more around the softer skills associated with our sector, um, around communication, budget management, um, management responsibility, leadership, and really helping to plug that gap for the softer skills. People can be able to demonstrate a record of their CPD and maintaining that professional status as well so that they can say to employers and deployers that they're staying at the forefront of the sector and what's going on. But I suppose fundamentally one of the key things that, um, that students potentially could be able to do is apply for jobs while they're in training. Now, it is an element that we would obviously advocate that people do complete their course is something that if they choose they can have a part-time job on the side if they do meet the requirements for a certain professional standard. They also get general benefits such as um, our SMPA professional magazine and sector discounts as well. So 
we have a we have a full suite of individual support for members, but also we have partnership opportunities as well. So if there are any centres that are that are looking for more information about that, then we have a we have a full team of partnership executives that can help to provide that that support as well. Great. No, that's perfect. Thank you. So for what we have on both our website and uh, which links to your website, is it shows learners and centres when a learner gets to the end of that qualification, what they can do with their certification for their BTEC um, to be able to then register with yourselves and become a SIMSPA member and start accessing those opportunities. This, this next uh, visual is maybe something we don't need to go into a huge amount of detail, but I think what it does is it really starts to shine a light on where the learners can go at the end and beyond of their program. Yeah, definitely, Gareth. I think, you know, ultimately as an individual member, you can really receive professional recognition at all stages of your career. So right the way from taking your student and all the way up to, you know, being a, a chief exec of an organisation that works in the sector. So our membership basically helps to provide that recognition for students at that entry level to be able to put that their best foot forward and show that they're really, really committed to working and developing in this sector. And also when they look at um, when they're applying for jobs and, and how they profile themselves as well, then it, it basically is to set them apart from, from other individuals. Brilliant. And I think just something to, to highlight as well for, for learners and centres, re regardless of whether they're in FE, private training providers, work-based learning, that actually this is also acknowledged and being supported within HEIs as well, this, this recognition of SIMSPA and the value of it. Um, is, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, Gareth. It's something that a lot of the work that we do is, is trying to join that sector together. So how do we make best use and work really, really strongly with further education, higher education, training providers who are, who are operating privately in the sector, but also importantly is how we link the students that are on those programmes into employment and deployment. So whether that is through um, local leisure centres and student placements, whether that's into governing bodies or even local community clubs as well. So trying to create that ecosystem for an individual to have that transparency and ease of transitioning through different roles that they maybe want to to carry out in the sector too. Yeah, and this slide really really speaks to that, doesn't it? That that sort of shared knowledge and understanding and how it can lend itself across the piece of the sector and enabling people's sort of mobility, whether that's around interest or opportunities or, or just variety. Absolutely, and you know, I would say that. Probably myself, Tash, I don't know about you, but my, I mean, my background, if I had known at 16 years old what, what job I would be doing today, and if you'd asked me to identify what path I was going to take, I would not have a clue. I couldn't tell you what, what jobs were going to lead me to, into my current position. And there's not really been that, that clarity of pathways within the, the sport and physical activity sector before. So ultimately, when we link back to the, the professional standards that Tash was talking about earlier on, we look at our different industries, actually by creating occupational maps for the, the six different industries that we have within sport and physical activity, mapping out the individual occupations within them, within the, the knowledge, the understanding and the skills that are required. But how do we help to bridge those gaps so for instance somebody um, in exercise and fitness who's coming in at, with an entry-level qualification as you know potentially a group exercise instructor how does that person progress what knowledge understanding and skills do they require in order to, to develop themselves to potentially become a duty manager or potentially then um, you know move across as you can see in that diagram it might be that they actually want to go and work in a governing body. They want to go and do a strength and conditioning course and, and help to support in a high performance environment. So trying to, to work with the sector to create that clarity across roles for that development as well has, has been a really, really critical part of what we've been working on. Yeah, and that plays to that point as well, an additional point to sort of support the, the, the requirement of those professional standards and, and the mapping within qualifications. So this here, this again sort of speaks for itself. So it'd be really great for, for learners to get to a point where they're able to demonstrate physically, whether it's with a card or digitally, um, that they do have the professional standard and they are members. 
Yeah, absolutely, Gareth. I think that when we when we look into the future, you know, in an ideal world, what what you see in this screen is actually, you know, a recognised professional being able to demonstrate to both an employer and the general public what it is that they're actually qualified and experienced to deliver. So who can they deliver with? What environment is it that they work in? And what, what service is it that they're actually providing? Again, going back to, you know, imagine a future where, you know, a parent has, has clarity that they can check that their child's coach is qualified and safe to practice. Um, you know, when we think about a manager, actually, they want to be able to know that who are they recruiting into a specific job actually has the appropriate knowledge, understanding and skills. So trying to, again, work with the sector to create that system in the future where it, it really, really is clear for everybody, no matter whether you have a good knowledge and you already work in the sector and you're a hiring manager, but also parents of young children who maybe don't know anything about the sport and physical activity sector and what knowledge, skills and understanding somebody should have in order to coach their child as well. Great, thank you. So I think within this sort of bite-sized session, what we have done is we've, we've shared a, a common understanding for, for centres, learners, practitioners, and those people looking at both BTEC and those sort of mapped qualifications with SIMSPA, what that means and, and what the value is and, and the importance for our sector within sport and sport and exercise science and beyond. Um, we've also sort of shared a sense of where they can go next, what they can do or what they might do in the future with the qualification that is mapped with a professional standard or and or specialism and also with their membership together with those endorsed qualifications. So I think that leaves me to to thank you both. Uh, Susie and Tash, really appreciate your time and um, great to be working with you and look forward to future developments. Thank you both. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks for having us. Bye yeah, now. thanks, Gareth.